The following program is a sports handicapping show. That's right, we will be discussing sports betting and all kinds of other gambling stuff, including game predictions. As you know, not every bet will win, but we do our best. Feel free to use this information at your own risk, and remember, wager wisely, folks. Broadcasting from the Vegas Video Network Studios, live from the Las Vegas Strip, Covers.com presents Vegas Sports Day. And now from the sports betting capital of the world, here are your hosts, Teddy and the Professor. It's Monday in Sin City, and you are watching Vegas Sports Day, the pulse of the sports betting world. I'm your host, Teddy Covers, joined as always by my esteemed colleague, the professor, Dave Malinsky. Coming up today, were the 2011 Diamondbacks for real or just snakes in the grass? NBA playoffs may be several weeks away, but in reality, are they down to a Final Four already? And sometime this evening in New Orleans, CBS will start playing one shining moment. We're going to tell you who's in the video montage behind the music later in today's show. So, Dave, first take on a Monday. Lots of good action this past weekend. Obviously, baseball just on the horizon. The final four matchups on Saturday, both compelling and down to the wire from a points red perspective. And, of course, the NBA uh, on full display all weekend. What's your first take for a Monday for our viewing audience? I almost wanted to be an Associated Press college basketball writer and say, huh, there was, stuff was going on? Uh, they did something mind-boggling again this week. You know, about 12 years ago, give or take, when we were doing a show called The Stardust Line in Las Vegas, they named Matt Dougherty the AP College Coach of the Year. And on the show that night, I said, that's the single most mind-boggling thing I had ever seen in sports. It would sound like an extreme statement. It wasn't. Matt Dougherty stepped in at North Carolina, inherited a good team, did nothing with it, got knocked out of the tournament early by Penn State. Lousy year. What happened the next two years? Carolina had a losing record. To have a losing record over two years at North Carolina, you got to stink. So he struggles on, he moves to SMU, gets fired recently because he went 80 and 108 at SMU. So you AP writers, when you voted, look at how good you did. Now comes word that Frank Haight from Missouri was the AP coach of the year. What did Frank Haight do? Nothing. He inherited a bunch of seniors, already had a system in play, came to practice and said, you guys are pretty good. What you do, that's pretty good too. Why don't you just go out and do it? So what happens, of course, first round of the NCAA tournament, one of the biggest upset losses in tournament history. Haith did not have his team prepared. Part of the problem is that AP finishes their voting at the end of the regular season, not the postseason. That is totally nonsensical in college basketball because the purpose for so many teams is to build your team to be ready at tournament time. Rick Pitino this year, six points per game, perhaps better than Frank Haith, because he was preparing his team for tournament time. Didn't win as many games, didn't have to, coaching a different way. When you look at Bill Self bringing his team along, look at Calipari. Look at these coaches who were bringing their team along to play at their best when it mattered most. You should never, ever do that vote at the end of the regular season. But the fact that Hank, Frank Haith won anyway, in the regular season, for literally inheriting a team and changing nothing just shows how so far out of touch they are. So Matt Doherty, way back when, Frank Haith last week, AP college basketball writers, I want to watch a game every once in a while. I know you were watching some games this week. Of course. How tense. When Louisville seemingly is running out the clock on Saturday to cover the spread, how tense were you feeling? Uh, it it was, uh, it was and, and it was kind of a bizarre end game there. Oh, with uh, kind of a bizarre, it was extremely bizarre uh, end game uh, with Louisville, Kentucky. But you're, you know, you're obviously sweating out that last foul. Uh, the last Louisville possessions were uh, possession where just you know Siva's walking up the court. <laughs> uh, glad they uh, hit a three on that possession. That's all I'm going to say. Got the cover by the hook, and again, those half points can and do and will matter. Uh, makes the, however you handicap that game, at good line shoppers got the best of it. You laid it with Kentucky, you pushed. If you laid it with Louisville, uh, you got the win. And for betters, that's obviously a best-case scenario. But 
Uh, my first take uh, on a Monday has to do with this show. As we announced on Friday, obviously, uh, this is the final show of season one for Vegas Sports Day. And I sincerely hope that we provided some valuable information over the course of the year that helped you win some bets and become a better handicapper overall, explaining the thought process behind the wagers that professional bettors uh, here in Las Vegas, like Dave and myself, uh, put, uh, put down uh, on a daily basis. Sports betting and poker are the future of gambling. When you look at positive expectation opportunities in the casino environment, that's what you have, sports betting and poker. And I'm certain that the growth that we've seen in this industry, even during a downtime for the U.S. economy and the world economy, will only continue and grow as the economy picks up in the years to come. So I have no doubt that this show will continue to attract new viewers, and I'm really looking forward to season two starting in August. So I close out every show by saying thanks for taking time out of your busy day to spend with us. Hey, thanks for taking time out of your busy year to That's spend it? with us. We're done? Yeah, we're done. Let's, oh, let's call okay. the show. <laughs> no. Uh, no, 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 we're not done. Uh, but okay. I do want to note that uh, over the course of the year, you guys have sent us some great emails. We're not going to disappear. Keep emails coming in. We'll answer them uh, as, uh, as the opportunity permits. Uh, of course, we'll give all the contact information at the end of this segment. But for now, I just want to encourage you, keep the ideas coming in. Show will be back in August, and we're looking for Season 2 to be even better than Season 1 based on your suggestions and recommendations. For now, we got to get to some unfinished business, namely the NL West preview. We've gone through the other five divisions. We're going to do the NL West today. And once again, using the same format on the graphic you're about to see uh, as we've done through the first previous five divisions. We're going to list last year's win total and this year's odds to win the division. It starts with the Arizona Diamondbacks, won 94 games a season ago. They're slight dogs to win this division behind San Francisco, plus 175. Betting markets don't expect Kirk, Kirk Gibson and company to repeat. <clears throat> the San Francisco Giants won 86 games a year ago. They're plus 145 to win the division this year, the favorites per se. L.A. Dodgers, an 82-win team last year, plus 625 to win the division this year. Betting markets expecting more out of Colorado this time around, a 73-win team a year ago, also plus 625 this year. And the San Diego Padres, 71-91 and 91 in 2011. They're 22-1 to 1 to win the NL West in 2012. So why isn't Arizona the automatic favorite off of all those wins last year, the markets are pretty savvy. Arizona had a magnificent ride to get to that 94. When we talk about that, here's why. Look at the run differential. It doesn't get you anywhere near those 94 wins. 84 and 0 when leading after the eighth inning. Not likely to repeat that. 28 and 16 in one run games. If you study baseball history, teams that have a double figure margin in one run games tends to reverse the following year. And in terms of player games lost to injury, who had the fewest in the National League? It was Arizona. It's just one of those years where you didn't have a lot of bad bounces. That 28 and 16 in one-run games, that's not going to repeat. Injuries just happen. Um, there's a, you want to say, no, we're well-conditioned, we're trained. No, a lot of it is just random. But the other issue Arizona has is the back end of their rotation has not looked terribly good this spring. Uh, they were hoping Trevor Cahill could come over from Oakland. Cahill's not that good. Cahill's a guy who had one very fluky year with the batting average on balls in place that also survived from those American League West ballparks at night. He's just an average guy. The guy who also that may turn out to be average, Josh Colmenter, who has a tricky delivery, did well the first pass through when hitters couldn't figure the delivery out. But you know what? Once you get beyond the delivery, here's a guy maxing out in the upper 80s with his fastball right now. And then it leaves Joe Saunders um, at the back end, who simply is who he is. With that bottom three in the rotation and a lineup that's probably going to suffer some bumps and bruises, yeah, I can see why the markets don't have them as the favorite. It's possible Arizona could fall far from that 94 win total. Yeah, from a historical perspective, you can understand why the markets don't like Arizona. As Dave talked about, that 84-0 record when leading after eight, the lack of injuries, the question marks in the back end of the rotation – and again, this was the number one team in profits for any team to support last year in Major League Baseball. If you bet the D-backs in every game, you made more money 
than if you bet every other team in baseball for every game over the season. They were big, big money makers. But the key when we talk about the historical perspective was the huge wind jump that Arizona had a season ago. They went from being a last place team in the division, or last place contender, I believe they were ahead of San Diego the previous year, uh, into uh, the first place team. And when you see teams take that type of a leak, leap, the historical norm is for them to drop back down. Last year was the leap. This year <laughs> is the leak. Well, right. the thing is, I, I'm not convinced that Arizona is going to fall apart. I, I look at Arizona as being a confident team in a way that they weren't a year ago. You know, when Stephen Drew comes back, this lineup is potent. It's as potent as any, more potent than any in the division. They'll be able to score runs, whereas other teams still trying to scratch out runs in a division that had a very, very hard time getting runners across home plate last year. You look at the front end of that staff with Ian Kennedy and Daniel Hudson. Both guys have the potential to be Cy Young contenders. And the bullpen, which was so good for the D-backs a season ago. Hey, guess what? It's going to be a good bullpen again this year. Uh, even though Arizona not likely to win 94 games, no, don't deserve necessarily to be favorites in this division, guess what? I still think there's money to be made riding Kurt Gibson's squad again in 2012. San Francisco is sort of the flip-flop of Arizona when you talk about injuries. Last year, the Giants, 866 player games, lost to injury, 24 different trips to the DL. That's how, that's how you waste an awfully good pitching staff. Uh, Buster Posey, the biggest injury, because that was a bat they could not replace in the middle of the lineup. But now, envision this team if Posey comes back healthy. You've got Sandoval at number three, Posey at number four, and Belt at five, who we believe is going to be fine. Now, there's a little bit of punch in the middle of that rotation if the table setters can do the job for them. And look at the depth of that bullpen. You can make a case Sergio Romo might have been the best relief pitcher in baseball last year. The Giants have some upside where we're a little bit concerned, and maybe a guy we can look at from a value standpoint. Tim Linscombe's walk rate and strikeout rate have been in a slow, gradual decline. It could be that his best stuff um, actually is behind him. Maybe some value to play against Lincecum a little bit. The markets may like him better than his stuff. But the flip side, value to play on Madison Bumgarner, a guy who actually pitched much better than some of the bottom line tables will show from last year. You know, I mean, uh, the Giants, let's call it Exhibit A, on how to waste good pitching uh, from a season ago. Uh, great pitching numbers, insane pitching numbers. They were uh, a, one of the uh, top teams in baseball, I think number three in, in all of baseball in ERA consistently holding opponents to two, three, or four runs per game. But, of course, the offense was so anemic. Only 570 runs scored for the entirety of the season. And as Dave mentioned, this year they should be putting up at least a few more runs, especially uh, if uh, Posey can get healthy, stay healthy, and hit like he did when he was a rookie. Uh, three ifs, but nonetheless, uh, he's certainly likely to provide some type of an upgrade for San Francisco offensively, uh, that was a team that just simply couldn't afford to lose their cleanup hitter last year, and obviously they did. But, you know, 570 runs scored, that has to go up. We saw this team 70 and 85 to the under uh, last year with all of these 2 to 1 and 3 to 2 and 4 to 3 type of ball games. And we saw a seismic shift in the betting marketplace with these West Coast teams, particularly the NL West, but the AL West as well. But it was the NL West that had a betting marketplace that was reluctant to price any total lower than 6.5 prior to last season. You'd see 7s, you'd see the occasional 6.5. Last year, the baseline, it made that move. 6.5 down to 6, even 5.5 uh, on these Giants games on a consistent basis. If Dave's right about Lincecum regressing a little bit and this lineup improving a little bit, if we see those 5.5 and, and 6 this year, might be some good money to be made betting San Francisco up and over the total on a daily basis. He had to get one last one of those in. For this <laughs> a lot of people are trying to talk up the Dodgers. Um, we're not. Because a lot of what they're saying isn't quite real. We've heard so many different respected baseball people say, look, new ownership, new attitude, they're going to jump out and play well. There was nothing wrong with the Dodger attitude last year. Uh, at what should have been a downer of a season with all those off-field issues, look at how well they played down the stretch to finish with the losing record. Dodgers played good baseball the last couple of months. Here's the problem we have going forward, and it's comparable to some other teams we talked about where good players had max out years. Clayton Kershaw was fantastic. He can't be any better than that. If he's fortunate, he'll be as good. Matt Kemp, he had a dynamite year. 
he's not going to be that good again. He could be great, but he's not going to match that. If your two best players have even a slight decline, where does the rest come from? This is an awfully mediocre lineup. They've got arguably the worst catchers in baseball. Bottom of their pitching rotation, you've got some older retreads. You'd like to think, okay, we are an up-and-coming team. We're going to develop. And you look, and here's Aaron Harang, Chris Capuano, Ted Lilly, when he becomes healthy. Those are kind of older retreads. Uh, the Dodgers may have already played some of their best baseball last year. We're not as optimistic as many others are. And it doesn't look like the betting market is particularly optimistic about L.A. either. When we look at the odds to win this division, they're priced with the exact same number as the Colorado Rockies, a 73-win team uh, from uh, a season ago. And again, uh, last year, as Dave mentioned, Dodgers, they were money makers. You know, they were finished 12th in Major League Baseball in terms of profits for the season, right behind St. Louis, right ahead of the L.A. Angels, two teams that finished with much better records or with better records than the Dodgers were able to accomplish a season ago. And a lot of that had to do with the positive attitude through all the turmoil. Now, okay, the weight has been lifted. The team has been sold. The McCourt era is over in L.A. If you don't count the uh, profits he's due to make from the <laughs> revenue generated from the sur property surrounding the stadium. Uh, but the bottom line for the Dodgers is that they responded well to adversity a season ago. And when you look at guys like Harang and Lilly and uh, Capuano, they fit okay into that Dodgers ballpark where fly balls go to die. You don't see uh, a lot of home runs uh, at Dodger Stadium. Uh, it has obviously been one of the more pitcher-friendly parks and a good place for fly ball pitchers to survive and have decent seasons. But at the same time, you know, they finished fifth in baseball in ERA last year. Still, at no point were they in contention to win this division, and I'm not convinced they're going to be in contention in 2012 either. Rockies are a difficult team to break down. I mean, imagine you're a season ticket holder. Think, okay, we had a disappointing season. We're looking forward to management going out there and getting us turned around for the future. And management says, yeah, we did that. We brought on Marco Scudero, brought in Casey Blake, brought in Michael Kadire, and our first two pitchers are going to be Kevin Guthrie and Jamie Moyer. Okay, th those are the sort of veterans you bring in when you're off of an 85-win season, and you're trying to take that final patch up to the top. This is not a sign of direction. Uh, this is almost like a franchise that's a little bit lost. Uh, yeah, you picked up a couple of good young arms for Ubaldo Jimenez. Maybe that will matter later. But when Moyer is your number two starter in the rotation, and Casey Blake is an everyday player for you, that's not a good sign. The one guy we might actually like a little bit, though, is Jeremy Guthrie. Because look at what he was able to do. He's traded starts against the Yankees in the Bronx, against the Red Sox in Fenway. Now, China Basin against the Giants, Dodgers, Chavez Ravine, Padres, Petco Park. Yeah, Coors Field can be tough on a pitcher, but look at the gap in road games between what Guthrie has now in his division and what he used to have. He's a little bit better than his stats the last couple of years, but should he be your opening day starter? Uh, no, we're not real excited about the chemistry of the Rockies right now. Yeah, and it's, it's an odd fit. You know, Guthrie is an innings eater. He's a guy that consistently gets 200 plus, but when you look at upside on that pitching staff, you may want to look a little bit deeper down in the rotation. Guys like Juan Nicasio and Julius Chassin and Drew Pomerantz, who are going to be the bottom end of that rotation, all have pretty nasty stuff and have potential to have uh, breakout seasons uh, this year. The consistency has been a problem, certainly for the uh, first two guys on that list. And uh, when we look at Colorado as a team, again, being priced, not necessarily as a contender, but as a team that uh, is supposed to be 500 or better this year. We're talking about a team that was number 29 in money earned last year. Only the dismal Houston Astros, the team with the worst record in baseball, uh, made uh, cost their backers more money a season ago. And a lot of that had to do with the high prices that you had to lay with some of those rocky starting pitchers who weren't winning ball games. Now, you know, Jorge De La Rosa got hurt uh, last year. They dealt away Ubaldo Jimenez. Carlos Gonzalez got off to that slow start. And guess what? It was rebuilding time. But the markets never really caught up with how bad this team was. And again, 83 and, 70 to, 83 and 73 to the over a season ago, 26th in baseball in team ERA. This in a division that had three of the top five teams in baseball in ERA. So when there's that much of a disparity, that, that much of a gap between your pitching and the pitching in the rest of the division, 
you can understand why Colorado lost so much money. If they're going to improve in any real way in 2012, it's going to have to be because the starting pitching and the bullpen both make significant improvements. And that's not something I'm eh, particularly bullish on right now, not something I'm willing to bet on. The 22 to 1 on the Padres is low. Uh, there are longer shots in this. This team has virtually no upside. He wanted to get Carlos Quentin in the lineup to add more power. He's going to start the season on the DL. But all he's going to do when he does play, he's going to fly out to the warning track in Petco, in L.A., in San Francisco. Uh, Quentin's one of these guys that's got that little power with the White Sox to get it out of the park in a very friendly environment. He's not a good fit here. Starting pitching rotation, you just, uh, you want to do that. You know, Tim Stouffer, opening day starter, just not that good. Edinson Volquez, can he come back around? Boy, it, it's tough. So we don't see any upside out of the Padres at all. The one thing we've never quite understood, and especially when they go and bring Quentin in in the offseason, from day one in Petco Park, why you have not built around speed and defense, we've just never grasped. Look at how many times they continue to bring these journeyman guys who they hope will provide a little bit of power. No, it should all be about speed. It should all be about defense. Until they do that, the Padres, they're going to languish right where they are. They may be fortunate to get to 70 this year. Yeah, but I mean, the uh, incredible thing about the Padres last year, again, they were 20 games under 500. They finished the year minus 18 in runs. That's the equivalent of like a, a 78 or 79 win team. Uh, so they underachieved in terms of the win total compared to their production. Why? Well, because their pitching was okay. And you look at this roster, uh, the rotation with Stauffer and Lubke and Volquez and Richard and Mosley, you know, Anyone can pitch in Petco. Uh, this team, like they have in every recent season, every game's going to be 3-2 to two or 4-3 to three or 2-1. to one. Uh, And if they can scratch out enough runs, which is a big if, but if they can scratch out some runs, they can be profitable uh, once again. Because uh, when you look at the numbers, you know, they won money on the road uh, a season ago. They played their worst ball uh, at home. Uh, that's something that could well continue this season. And the craziest stat of all, and when you look at this team, 81 and 74 to the over last year with an offense that couldn't hit worth a lick and a pitching staff that finished in the top five in the majors, number three, in fact, in total ERA. That tells you how low these Padres' baseline totals have gotten in that five and a half, six range. Unlike San Francisco, however, I'm not convinced we're going to see the type of offensive improvement that's likely to make San Diego a strong over team again in 2012, or at least a decent over team like they were a season ago. But We've gone through all these divisions, Dave, now. Uh, we've got to the point where it's time to give out some recommendations. You got something for us? Yeah, let's talk about our best plays uh, and recapping those six divisions. Number one team over underplay, Detroit Tigers under. Taking some action on that, there were 94s out there early. You can still find a 92 and a half. Tigers under a team that overachieved last year. Uh, we don't think that Verlander can match what he did. We know that Valverde will not match what he did. And for all the talk about Prince Fielder being added, you have to subtract Carlos Martinez. That's a small net plus, not a major one. Best division odds, Milwaukee. Uh, we talked about on our NL Central preview. We're not sure why Cincinnati is being priced as having a better chance to win than the Brewers. Brewers have that good, steady starting five. And yeah, you lose Fielder, you gain Aramis Ramirez in that lineup. So you lose a little. You don't lose a lot. Brewers to win the NL Central at a nice plus price. Tigers under for team wins. That's our two best for this year. I've got a couple as well. Uh, we'll start with uh, a division opinion, uh, like Dave gave his with Milwaukee. I'm going to take a look at Tampa Bay to win the AL East. Uh, nothing against the Yankees, nothing against the Red Sox, but 5-1 to one is the wrong price for the Rays, who look every bit as good as those two teams, better in the starting to pitching department than either of those two squads. We look at defense, a factor that's not priced correctly in the betting markets. When you're looking at little edges you can find, teams that play great defense are teams that oftentimes offer value. Tampa Bay uh, played defense as good or better than any in baseball a season ago. Joe Madden, a master in terms of getting his guys to be positioned correctly, turn base hits into ground ball outs, turn line drives into fly ball outs. That's what Tampa does. Back end of the bullpen looks rock solid. Rays are live in a division that they were live in a year ago. And uh, when you find a 5-1 to one dog that's live to win a division, yeah, uh, I'm all ears. 
From a win total perspective, I'm going to take a look at the Kansas City Royals uh, over, and you can find 79 and a half. We'll call that the prevailing line right now. Uh, you can actually find as low as 77 if you want to lay some juice. Uh, you can find as high as 81 if you're not shopping around. But 79 and a half is uh, pretty much the prevailing current number uh, for KC. And again, this is a team, they're going to score runs. They're going to score runs in bunches. You love uh, the hosmer Mustakas combination at the corner. You love uh, the signs that Gordon showed last year uh, in terms of uh, giving them another big bat in the middle of the order. You like the defense uh, at shortstop for KC, a pro problem area for them in seasons past. Pitching staff, decent, not spectacular, but there's been so much bad pitching for so long in Kansas City. Decent pitching is an upgrade. It's a division, as Dave was talking about, with Detroit being uh, not necessarily a false favorite at the top, but it's a division without boatloads of quality teams that they're going to have to beat. They can win season series against teams like Minnesota uh, and Chicago. They can uh, hold their own, uh, and if they can come close, uh, win you know, seven or eight games against Detroit. Uh, I look for KC to be at 500 or better when this season is over, and I'm going to take a look at the Royals over 79 and a half wins. So you ready to Twitter it up one last time? Absolutely. Let's, because, let's do it. Because it's not too late. Bottom line, I know this is the last show for season one. We're still going to be checking the emails uh, all summer long. So you got questions, you have suggestions, send them in, sportsday at covers.com. You can follow us on Twitter uh, at Vegas Sports Day. And, of course, no reason you shouldn't be in the forums contributing and making your voice heard. We go into the forums ourselves. Check them out, covers.com slash posting forum. Up next, it's time for the home stretch of the NBA season. And will the first round of the playoffs be even necessary? You're watching Vegas Sports Day. Are you looking for the latest odds, the fastest scores, the most important trends, and the best matchups and stats? Are you looking for the key late breaking information that can make you a winner? Well, Covers.com has the answer. The world's largest sports betting community gives you a front row seat in the heart of the action from the opening lines to the final scores. If you want to stay ahead of the game, Covers covers the numbers. Hey, I'm Al Man. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how you get them to do that all the time? <laughs> Just sit there and be an ass. <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> hey, I'm Al. <laughs> hey, I'm Al Mancini at Top of the Food Chain. You are watching the Vegas Video Network. We got big forks, big spoons. I got a big mouth. I got no guest. It's market watch times. We break down the final month of the NBA season because it's crunch time for the playoff races. Outside of the top two teams in each conference, every other seating position looked like they could really go down to the wire. Now you look at the numbers right now in the East, only two and a half games separate the third seed from the seventh seed. We're going to see jockeying right through the final day of the regular season. In the West, only three and a half games separate the number five seed from the number 10 seed outside of the playoffs looking in. So again, competitive races to make the postseason and competitive races within the two conferences to earn that coveted home court advantage in the first round. So let's make that the theme for today's Market Watch and break down this NBA sprint to the finish line. Now, one of the things Teddy said is, of course, the top two teams are the only ones that are set in each conference. And that's where we really focus in today, because outside of the top two in each conference, boy, it looks like there's a chasm as we break them down and compare it to the rest. So what are we going to do on today's chart? We're going to show the odds on those top four, not even show the rest, because we think the rest are just pretenders. But then we'll see, OK, who might have a chance to at least win a series or extend someone. So let's take a look right now at the current future book odds for the top four teams in the NBA. This is fresh as of this morning because we had some dramatic um, games played yesterday that impacted. Miami, still a pretty solid favorite at plus 180. Oklahoma City now plus 335. Chicago plus 375. And for some reason, uh, boy, the markets just don't like the Spurs. You can still take 12 to 1 on San Antonio this morning. We know that because we already have. We took a little bit more over the weekend on them. Yeah, these teams ahead are awfully talented. But get Greg Popovich one-on-one -on -one against Scott Brooks in a playoff series. Get him one-on-one -on -one against Eric Spolstra in a playoff series. 
Um, and maybe Tom Thibodeau will give him a good battle, but we'll still favor Pops even in that one. So right off the bat, we see a little bit of value to San Antonio. But here's what's interesting about these last couple of days. Oklahoma City went through some doldrums after the All-Star break. Then it became time to step up. Miami came to town. You had to go out and play the Lakers. Chicago came to town. When it was time to step up, they sure did. Yeah, they sure did. They got my money twice uh, during this particular run, and I uh, bet on them once in the game against L.A. Uh, but uh, the bottom line for OKC is here in the regular season. Right now, they're in position to, uh, if they win tonight and the Bulls lose, which, you know, Chicago's eight and a half point favorite, so it's not likely to happen, but if the Bulls have a hangover from yesterday's absolute beatdown uh, on the hands of the Thunder, guess what? OKC's got the best record in the league. They will have home court advantage throughout the course of the playoffs. But we look at these top teams, you know, uh, Derek Rose and his injury with Chicago. You can make an argument that Rose's injury will help the Bulls come playoff time. This is a brutal, condensed season, and the schedule has gotten every veteran team worn down. We talked about the ability from some guys, uh, for some guys when they get hurt to come back relatively fresh, and if Derek Rose is fresh for the postseason, that's bad news for everyone uh, that Chicago is going to face. And, of course, it doesn't look like this Rose injury is going to linger on forever. He will get back in the lineup, the Bulls being extra careful to make sure uh, that he's 100% because once he comes back, they obviously don't want to have him uh, sit out again. Their toughest contender in the East is obviously going to be Miami. These two teams played in the Eastern Conference Finals last year. You can project they will play in the Eastern Conference Finals again this year. And the question uh, that we have to ask ourselves, Dave, are the Heat any better in 2012 than they were in 2011? About a week ago, we had a chart on this show that showed how well the Heat had rebounded off of losses this year. They went into Indiana and said, okay, this is the time where they usually step up. Well, they went in, they got smacked. And they kept getting smacked all week long. They're actually playing the worst basketball of the season right now. And maybe it gets back to the basic tenets of the game. Historically, the point guard position and the center position have been the real keys in pro basketball. If you're good at those two spots, you don't even need all that much anywhere else. Miami is going to try to do that differently. Going to win with players on the wing. But as good as LeBron and Wade are, that's a non-traditional way of playing basketball because it takes so much energy from them for the team to be successful. They have to go out and get their own shots. They don't have a point guard creating it for them. They have to guard hard on defense because there's not a shot blocker in the paint. This was a very tired Miami team over the past week. And the fact that the schedule doesn't offer any breathers means they could be a tired team heading into the playoffs. And their difficulty in the first round, right now it's either going to be the Celtics or the 76ers, neither of which can beat Miami in a playoff series, but both of which can make the Heat work and take some more out of their legs. It could be as tired as Miami looks right now. They never do get re-energized. See, I'm, I'm not convinced that the regular season and the ugliness of this regular season has been. And we're talking about a handful of teams that are going to have some absolutely brutal Aprils, uh, San Antonio, for, for one, that may go into the postseason with tired legs. But the bottom line is, once the postseason begins, you're going to have days off uh, between every game, uh, like you do every year in the playoffs, and teams won't have that fatigue issue, unless they're so worn down, they won't have the fatigue issue that, uh, that has been confounding them throughout the course of the regular season. And you look at guys that Miami didn't have last year, particularly low post guys. Udonis Haslam wasn't there uh, a season ago. He was hurt. Uh, you've got uh, the recent acquisition of Ronnie Turiaf, I think, matters. And, of course, Shane Battier, another defensive stopper on the wing, another veteran addition for Miami. I do think they are a notch or two better than they were a season ago. But, on the other hand, we switch to the West – so is Oklahoma City, and so is San Antonio. Uh, when you're talking about wearing down, uh, I mean, the, the Thunder have relied on their superstars. Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook, more than any other team, has relied on their top duo. And those two have the potential to be a little bit gassed once the postseason rolls around. But on the other hand, both of them are playing at a really high level right now. On both ends of the floor, uh, OKC has shown over the course of the last week, at least from a regular season perspective, they are the team to beat, both in the West and maybe in the whole NBA. So can anybody break through? Unlikely. But if you're going to look for a little value out there, let's start with the Mavericks if Brendan Haywood comes back healthy for the playoffs because you've got that veteran character and the idea that they can take on Oklahoma City and San Antonio without being intimidated. Lakers have a chance um, to steal a series because of the inside game. You know what Kobe can do in the playoffs. 
not sure how many others can win, but maybe where you want to focus, not so much in their series, but in what happens afterwards, are teams that can cause trouble, teams that will make you work. I talked about Miami being locked into that number two spot, Celtics or 76ers. They're going to make you work. They're going to take something out of your legs that could matter in subsequent rounds. So that's one of the things where we don't necessarily say, you want to play Philly here, you want to play Boston here. No, if they can take Miami out to five or six games, those teams, by making you work, will have impacted the proceedings. And you know Boston will go into any playoff series believing they can win. Yeah, I mean, the Celtics, I think, are live to uh, pull off a major upset at some point this postseason. We've seen Boston play better basketball over the course of the last month. And you, I, I can't think of a team in the league that is more adversely affected by the condensed schedule than a veteran team like Boston. But once the playoffs begin and they have that day off between games, that is a will-to-win type of team that has potential uh, to make some noise uh, in the month of May and perhaps even into June. But uh, uh, Dave talked a little bit about the 76ers, well-coached team, and they are going to take someone, they're going to give someone some problems in the postseason, despite their lack of fourth-quarter scoring during crunch time. But uh, two teams from the West that merit at least some discussion here, the Memphis Grizzlies, a team that made a bunch of noise in the postseason last year, and a team that showed this past weekend in kind of a must-win step-up spot in Milwaukee that they're not going to go quietly again this year. Zach Randolph still working his way back in the rotation, but Memphis, they're going to be a tough out, and they're going to be physical, and they're going to give somebody some problems in the postseason. A lot of times, determining the winner has to do with who stays healthy. If you play the Grizzlies in a seven-game series or a six-game series, you may not be healthy at the end of it. The other one is a team we've kind of ripped on this show a fair bit, but at the same time, the L.A. Clippers, they have some depth. They have, uh, obviously, a superstar in Blake Griffin, and they've got... Best point guard in the NBA in Chris Paul, a guy who's had postseason success in the, in the past and a guy who could have postseason success again this year, though. Uh, you want to make an, uh, a line on, say, uh, Vinny Del Negro Popovich coaching matchup. Uh, what, Popovich minus eight, Dave? Somewhere in that range? That all? Yeah. <laughs> could be worse. Yeah, exactly. Up next, it's time to head into New Orleans. And no, you don't want one of those hurricanes in a mason jar. That's just going to give you a headache tomorrow morning. <laughs> when you watch tonight's championship game, pour yourself some of the good stuff. We're going to break that game down for you right next. Traditional media believes that after about three minutes, you'll tune out. Most Vegas media companies think if it doesn't jiggle, you won't tune in. At the Vegas Video Network, we think both are wrong. The Vegas Video Network is the first and only live online broadcast network that specializes in insider news and expert views about Vegas. We combine great storytelling with the ability to watch when and where you want on your computer, mobile device, or television. Discover the real Las Vegas. Visit VegasVideoNetwork.com. Livestream is your premier place to watch live events on the web, mobile devices, and connected TVs. See new events daily or broadcast your own at Livestream.com. Livestream. Be there. Yeah, Dave. You know it's coming. Cover your ears. It's m -m 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 money time! Gonna love the next couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> this edition of Money Time is brought to you by Covers.com. Remember, for all the key information you need in every sport, Covers covers the numbers. Uh, like to start tonight in New Orleans, where Kentucky minus six and a half. You can find a minus six out there if you shop. You can find a plus seven out there if you shop. Total's been bet down now to one thirty-seven and a half. And Dave. Compelling matchup between two of college basketball's winningest, the, the two most winningest programs in college basketball history. Quite the uh, marquee matchup as opposed to the butler UConn debacle we saw a season ago. Yeah, this will be a whole lot different because the, the quality of basketball has to be better tonight. And basketball has a chance to be real, real good. It just might not be good the way you want it to be. There's going to be an awful lot of defense out there. Um, let's start with how Kansas got here. Imagine if someone said before the tournament starts, oh, by the way, Tyshawn Taylor will go 0 for 20 from three-point range in the tournament, and yet you're still going to be in the finals. How does that happen? That's kind of tricky. It means that you've played defense. How about the rest of the team? Also 19 for 59 from three-point range, 24.1% from long range. 
So how do you do that and get here? You play defense. And you play it awfully, awfully well. You play it at every position. Because you've almost got NBA size. You've got a shot blocker inside. You've got Robinson, <coughs> tough, tough power forward. The guards exert excellent pressure. But you have the guts. And maybe that's what we liked about this Kansas team. In the past couple of years, when you had some underclassmen like the Morris brothers and others who left early, it didn't quite come together. This team has come together because of the guts. As the games go on, the defense gets tougher. They're willing to exert that pressure out there. At halftime, they make good adjustments. The guys understand their roles because outside of Robinson, you know, you're not talking about a bunch of lottery guys here. So let's take a look at this defense. Now, something we set up last week was their defense at the under four timeouts in the second half. That's that end game. That means game is on the line. Well, they've been out there now with four consecutive games that were on the line. After that final timeout, only 17 points allowed. That is magnificent under end game pressure. If we stretch it a bit further, just talk about halftime adjustments, in the second half of those last four games, they allowed 24.2% and only six out of 42 from three point range. Fundamentally, that's some of the best defense we've ever seen, but it's gonna have to be good tonight because they're facing a serious challenge. Yeah, no question about it. When you look at the Kentucky offensive numbers that contrast with those Kansas defensive numbers, they are nothing short of impressive. And again, the Jayhawks as a team, they're shooting, what, 41%, 42% for the tournament. They have not shot the ball particularly well. Where they've been adept is winning these tight end games, will to win situations. Certainly they will have confidence in this game if it's a three-point game and then two minutes to play. I don't think there's any question about that. But when we talk about shutting down this Kentucky offense, boy, it's a different animal than anything that Kansas has seen so far in this tournament. Let's take a look at the hard numbers for the Wildcats and Coach Cal. You know, against Iowa State, they shoot 55.4%. out uh, Hold the Cyclones. It's a 43. Uh, that's actually what the Cyclones, I, I should have got, it's what the Cyclones allowed to other teams. Oh, I'm sorry. That's what yes. that table is. Thank you. What the Cyclones allowed to other teams was 43.4%. So uh, 12% better uh, against Iowa State than Iowa State normally allows. Against Indiana, uh, they shot close to 49% from the floor. The Hoosiers for the season uh, giving up 42% shooting. Against Baylor, 53%. The Baylor Bears uh, allowed uh, about 41.5% shooting for the season. Against Louisville, an outstanding defensive team, a team that shut everybody down, uh, held opponents under 38%, huh, not against Kentucky, 57% from the floor for the Wildcats on Saturday in a venue that's been particularly hostile for shooters in seasons past. In seasons past. And uh, the Louisville game certainly stands out to me because they only made two three-point shots in that ball game. They were able to pound the ball down low, get good shots in the paint, and good uh, looks from 10, 12, 15 feet. That mid-range game that so many college teams struggle to excel at, Kentucky's been real, real good at. And we're talking about balance for the ages from this Kentucky squad. Six players average between 12 and 15 and a half points per game. That's offensive balance. One guy's off, guess what? Somebody else is going to be on. Marcus Teague, the only guy on the squad who's shooting under 50% in this tournament, and guess what? He's at 48.9%. Uh, if he'd have made one more shot uh, as opposed to miss one more, he'd be at 50% as well. So it's a Kentucky team that's playing offense at a very different level right now. And considering where we've seen these Kentucky point spreads throughout the course of this tournament, Dave, maybe a little cheap. Yeah, let's focus on something Teddy talked about, taking good shots. Because there's been so many things misspoken about John Calipari in this tournament. Again, a lot of people with these old assumptions. Not a good technical coach. He just recruits great players. That's why they win. You've seen a Kentucky kid take a bad shot at any time since maybe that opening game against Western Kentucky. And, and we didn't put the Western Kentucky game in that graph because they really weren't a tournament team. This team plays good, smart, unselfish basketball. And again, think about that uh, stat he told you. In the tournament, six players averaging between 12 and 15.4. That's balance. They share the ball. They're committed to winning the game. You take a player like Davis inside, um, who if he played somewhere else could be scoring 25 points, grabbing 15 rebounds. No, he is playing inside of the team framework. So this is a team that enjoys playing together. One of the things we really loved, um, watching Calipari and Davis after the game on Saturday, 
Liz Davis is such a well-rounded player. He actually was a guard in high school, so we had a growth spurt. And they're talking about the fact that he tried to petition to the coach, let me play point guard in one of these games. Calipari had one of the best answers of the whole tournament. Anthony, you come back next year, you'll be the starting point guard. Absolutely <laughs> love that, because now you see that from them. When we're worried about a team with a bunch of freshmen being tight under pressure, no, they are balanced, they are relaxed. This has been a very, very well-coached basketball team. But Teddy brought up a good point, though. Get him in a close game with two minutes left. One of the problems with balance is that you don't have any one guy that is the go-to player when you have to have that shot. So tie game or close game, two minutes left, you know what you're going to get out of Kansas. They're going to get them right out to midcourt and guard you every foot inside that midcourt line. Does Kentucky have someone who's willing to take that shot? Because they haven't had to yet. And, you know, we talk about some of the defensive focus in this ballgame. And you look at the numbers in the paint. Just phenomenal. Uh, with Kansas, obviously, Withy uh, has been uh, just sick in terms of his defensive. And Withy and Davis combined for 50 blocks uh, in this tournament. Kansas has blocked 31 shots out of 303 opponents' field goal percentage. They're more than 10% of all shots against Kansas in this tournament have been blocked for Kentucky. Same stat, 34 blocks out of 326 total shots against. Those are insane type of numbers. Uh, the type of numbers that spell, if this game is a half-court game, boy, uh, points may well be hard to come by. And, you know, for Kentucky, they're not a team that forces a lot of turnovers. Only 297 in the country at, at forcing turnovers. Only 51 turnovers forced through five NCAA games. So if Kansas can get into that half-court slog, it certainly gives them a chance to hang tough and pull one out at the end and obviously cover uh, the number at minus six or plus six, plus six and a half, plus seven. However, if this game's played a little bit faster pace, I think that will benefit the Wildcats who love that run and gun style, who have been unstoppable in that run and gun style. And, and frankly, when we talk about the, what this game and this point spread could easily come down to, free throw shooting by Kentucky at the end of the game, you know, if this line's minus eight, eh. Uh, I, I don't get to the window with Kentucky, but seven is still a win number. Seven, the most important number when it comes to college basketball betting, other than one, two, and three. Seven, the most important, uh, because uh, that's three possessions. You tend to stop fouling at seven at the end of the ball game if you're down uh, that third possession. And Kentucky's free throw shooting wasn't good against Louisville. Eleven of twenty from the charity stripe in that ball game. But I still can't forget what they did against Indiana. Thirty-five of thirty-seven. I'm not convinced the Wildcats have played their best game in this tournament, and they have the potential to extend late if given the opportunity. Given Kansas's struggles from the three-point line throughout the course of this tournament, if it comes down to that foul and three-pointer situation, a tight game could get away from the Jayhawks late. That'd be a concern for me if I was on the Kansas side. So how does it break down? Not a lot of tempo early because neither team is going to press. They won't extend their defenses. Self wants a half-court game because he believes he can guard Kentucky. Here's the problem. Kentucky transitions so well because the one thing they can do, and it's something we just haven't seen from almost anyone else uh, outside of these undersized teams like in Missouri, whoever gets a defensive rebound for Kentucky puts the ball on the floor and they start their movement up the court. Even if it's Anthony Davis inside, technically a center, how many times do you see him grab a rebound, put the ball on the floor, and start a break? They're so good at pushing the ball that way. So look for self to try to slow it down Try to hit the offensive boards enough to say, okay, if we don't get that rebound, stop the ball right there. If Davis is going to put it on the floor, stop him right there. Because he can guard Kentucky. He can hang in the game by guarding them. What he can't do, just can't score. There, there just aren't many open shots available against the Kentucky defense. The Kansas offense, uh, Tyshawn Taylor, who is really lacking in confidence, you don't expect that to all of a sudden come around, especially in the Superdome. So scoring is going to be difficult for Kansas. We can see them hanging in the game for a long time, being physical, doing some of the things Louisville did. But sooner or later, as Teddy has said on this show, and I hate to use one of his phrases because it's terrible, <laughs> yeah. you've got to put the biscuit in the basket. <laughs> I, I, so sorry for that, guys. You gotta it's a do good that. phrase. What's wrong with that? Can Kansas do that? Can they score well enough? Because one of the things they've been able to do is stay inside of contact. These end game defenses, these were close games where they didn't have to score quickly. 
But notice, you go back and look through those play-by-plays, their end-game offense has come off of their defense, forcing turnovers, getting out for easy layups. They haven't come down and made shots when they had to. That's the fear tonight. At some point, the game starts to break open because Kansas just can't score enough. Kentucky's got a lot of guys who can make their way to the basket. Kansas doesn't, and that's the big difference. So we think it's going to be a low-tempo game, not a lot of open shots. They may not make the shots that are there. But sooner or later, that Kentucky depth and just that wonderful Kentucky talent, we believe, takes control. And that's it, guys. That's going to wrap it up for Season 1 of Vegas Sports Day. Again, thank you for spending your valuable time with us. From Malinsky, I'm Savransky. Enjoy the games and good luck. We'll see you in 